Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar. Today's session will examine issues related to charity fundraising. We will look at charity fundraising responsibilities as well as some of the laws that cover fundraising around the various states and territories. We'll also look at the ways charities need to have oversight of their fundraising activities as well as some of the fundraising related issues charities need to keep an eye on. My name is April Kitchenham and I'm joined today by my colleague Chris Richards. Hi Chris. Hi everyone. Hi April. So just before we kick off, I will just cover a few um, housekeeping matters. If you have any troubles with the audio for the webinar, you can try listening through your phone. You can call the number listed in the email that you would have received upon sign up, put in the access code and listen to the webinar that way. If you do have a question to ask during the webinar today, we'd welcome it. To ask a question, just use the tools in the GoToWebinar panel on your screen. We have Nathan and Madison who are ready and waiting to answer all your questions. Um, as we do go along today, we'll try and answer all the questions that do come through, but depending on the quantity, we may not be able to get to every single one. If your question isn't answered today, um, please feel free to send us an email. Our email address is education at acnc.gov.au and we'll definitely get back to you. If we do have time, we'll follow up with a quick Q&A session at the end. Um, so if you wanted to watch the presentation and then save your questions until later, that's perfectly fine too. We are recording the webinar today and this recording and the transcript and the presentation slides will be published on the ACNC website in the next coming days. Also, you don't have to write down all the website references um, that will be shown on the slides either. We do send out a follow-up email with all the useful links and resources um, and that should come out in the next day or two. Last thing, we always value, uh, value your feedback and we do appreciate it if you could complete the short survey at the end of the webinar. Alternatively, you can email us and that's again to education at acnc.gov.au with any of your comments. Okay, so now that we've covered all the introductory bits and pieces, let's get into the webinar proper. Today we're going to cover a few fundraising relating issue, related issues and examine some of the risks in each as well as ways you can address or avoid problems. We'll start by uh, providing six quick best practice tips on charity fundraising that you should look at. Uh, we'll take a quick look at the various laws which co cover charity fundraising around Australia as well as provide a quick rundown on recent efforts to streamline fundraising legislation here in, in Australia. Uh, telephone and face-to-face -face fundraising are common ways for charities to attract donations, so we'll examine them, as well as some of the legal requirements and community expectations for these types of fundraising. The use of external or third-party fundraising agencies is one which often prompts strong responses. We'll explore the ins and outs of that issue throughout the webinar as well. We'll examine the issue of fundraising and vulnerable people, exploring who vulnerable people are, as well as the best practice guidelines when seeking donations from them. We'll also explore why charities spend money on fundraising, what acceptable behaviour behavior in this area looks like, and some of the issues which may crop up. And to round things out, we'll take a look at how charities can ensure any data they collect in the process of raising funds is handled properly, appropriately and securely. So we've got a lot to get through today, so let's get started. So six quick tips. All of them are pretty self-evident, but all of them are also worth emphasising. The first uh, and perhaps most important tip is to treat donors fairly and respectfully. Doing the right thing by your donors means they are more likely to continue their support of your charity, either through further donations or by volunteering or jumping on your board. Obviously, adhering to the second tip, ensuring donors never feel pressured to give, is one way to treat them respectfully. Never pressuring donors to give is just fundamentally good charity behaviour. You can certainly sell them or persuade them on the idea of giving, but overt pressure tactics are not on and not likely to win donors further support. Also related to the idea of treating donors respectfully is, in, is to tell them how your charity is spending their donation, sharing with them the impacts of their generosity and the difference it is making. Responsible persons have ultimate authority over a charity's fundraising behaviour. This includes any fundraising efforts that are outsourced or conducted on your charity's behalf by others. We'll cover this a little bit more when we discuss your charity working with fundraising agencies.
Your responsible persons do need to be across fundraising laws relevant to your jurisdiction. These laws vary depending on where your fundraising is to occur, though the ACNC continues to work hard to harmonise these laws. You also need to remember that it is okay to spend money to fundraise, to spend money to make money. But this spending needs to be in line with your charitable purposes, and it also needs to be reasonable, not wasteful or excessive. The final tip emphasises the need for donor data to be managed properly. This includes it being stored securely and not shared improperly. Again, we'll cover this in more detail later on in the webinar. So before we just get in, uh, we'll have a look at some of the stats uh, to do with charities and fundraising, and there's quite a bit of text on that slide, so uh, hopefully you've had a little bit of extra time to, to read through it. Um, look, it's important for charities to get their fundraising behaviour right, uh, and that's shown uh, through these stats. Fundraising from donations and bequests makes up a significant chunk of total charity income. Uh, over 8% overall, according to the ACNC's Australian Charities Report, and there's a link to that report uh, at the bottom of the screen there. But for smaller charities, the impact of donations and bequests is even higher. About 30% of small Australian charities, that's those with total revenue of $250,000 or less, relied on donations and bequests for more than half their income during the 2015 reporting period. Of Australia's more than 54,000 registered charities, nearly 63% received donations or bequests during that period. For many charities, fundraising is a key part of the public face of their organisation. The way a charity conducts fundraising can have a significant effect on the charity's work and its reputation. Public perception of the processes that a charity uses to raise funds are an important factor for a charity's responsible persons to consider. The erosion of public trust through a lack of transparency, inappropriate governance in fundraising practices, has the potential to be highly detrimental to the charity itself and the overall sector. So the ACNC sees good fundraising practice as a core governance responsibility of a charity's responsible persons. And when we mention responsible persons, we're talking about a charity's board, committee or governing body. When it comes to fundraising and the law, it's important to be aware of the ACNC's role, as well as that of other regulators. The ACNC does not have direct regulatory responsibility for charity fundraising. That responsibility lies with the states and territories, but it does maintain an interest in the issue for a few reasons. The first is our role in overseeing the ACNC's governance standards, including standard number two, accountability to members, and standard number three, compliance with Australian laws. We are also bound to ensuring charities' responsible persons do the right thing and comply with their duties under Governance Standard 5. As part of our objects listed under the ACNC Act, the ACNC has a duty to maintain, protect, maintain, protect and enhance public trust and confidence in the sector. It's also important to remember that the ACNC can act if a charity fails to meet its obligations or if it breaches the ACNC Act. Examples might include failure to protect and account for all funds raised, weak governance oversight of fundraising activities and resources, damage to public trust and confidence caused through a charity's fundraising activities, behaviour, or even what might be seen as excessive fundraising costs, where conflicts of interest and private benefit might not have been properly controlled, or serious or frequent failures in fundraising conduct, or even possible criminal conduct associated with fundraising. As we mentioned before, Australia's states and territories have responsibility for fundraising legislation. Charities must comply with the legislation of the jurisdiction in which they are fundraising. Of course, this can be challenging. State and territory laws aren't uniform, and it can be tough for charities to deal with different sets of laws if they are fundraising across borders, in multiple jurisdictions, or online, for example. Each state and territory has its own laws. Oh, sorry, I'll start again. Each state and territory, except for the Northern Territory, has its own laws and regulations with which charities, and sometimes those raising funds for charities, need to comply when fundraising there. A charity that wants to conduct fundraising at a national level may need to be registered to fundraise in each state and territory. And a charity may be in breach of fundraising laws and regulations if it accepts funds from someone living in a state or territory where the charity is not registered to fundraise. A charity's responsible persons must be aware of the laws that govern any fundraising activities they wish to undertake. 
Now, at this point, we should emphasise that the ACNC is continuing to work with state and territory governments uh, in order to harmonise requirements and reporting processes and to cut red tape. Now, there's plenty of information about what we're doing and who we're working with uh, to do so on the ACNC's red tape reduction webpage, and that's uh, found at uh, acnc.gov.au forward slash red tape reduction. In addition, the ACNC's fundraising hub acnc.gov.au forward slash fundraising lists the various fundraising laws which exist as well as the state and territory based agencies responsible for overseeing them. Uh, it might be a good idea to bookmark this page uh, and perhaps refer to it when, when considering your next fundraising activity. So telephone fundraising, face-to-face -face fundraising, door knocking and roadside collections are common ways for charities to raise money. This is because they are often effective, they can allow charities to tell their stories as well as raise funds and can see them get their brand out into the public domain. But using these methods is not without risk. Many members of the public can perceive these methods um, as annoying and intrusive, especially if they're not conducted properly or respectfully. Ultimately, the decision to use these methods of fundraising rests with the charity's responsible persons. The first thing they should think about, and this goes for any method of fundraising their charity uses, is whether the fundraising, fundraising method is the most suitable or effective for the task at hand. It might not be a great idea to launch a massive fundraising effort, like hit the streets or hit the phones, to just raise a few dollars. Ensure the size of any fundraising effort, as well as the method, fits your aims and a wider fundraising strategy you have in place. Charities should ensure that fun their fundraising meets community expectations and doesn't damage the public's trust and confidence in their organisation or in the sector overall. Really what this means is that those doing the phone or street fundraising, be they your own people or people from a fundraising agency or third party, need to do the right thing. Be respectful, don't be pushy, don't use pressure tactics, don't ring people up at bad times, respect people's right to refuse to donate, that sort of thing. Beyond meeting community expectations and not damaging public trust and confidence, any fundraising you do must of course comply with the law, state and territory, federal or even any local council laws that might be applicable. In addition, if, you're a chari if your charity is a deductible gift recipient, those who donate to you are likely to claim or want to claim a tax deduction for their donations. This means you'll need to issue a receipt to the donor. The Australian Taxation Office, which oversees decisions on DGR endorsement, suggests issuing a receipt and that would include the name of your organisation, your ABN, your Australian business number, and a note that the receipt is for a gift. In addition, receipts often include the amount of money donation, donated sorry, and the date the gift was given. As mentioned earlier, fundraising must meet ACNC governance standards as well. And as a final point, it's worth noting that charities undertaking telephone fundraising are exempt from complying with the Do Not Call Register. This means they can call people listed on the Do Not Call Register during their telephone fundraising efforts. However, being exempt from the register does not exempt charities from the responsibility to conduct fundraising in a way which meets community expectations for behaviour. Now, this might include removing from the list anyone, that's their name, their details, uh, who no longer wishes you to contact them or to uh, include you in any fundraising calls. Many charities choose to outsource their telephone or face-to-face -face fundraising activities to third parties, often an external fundraising agency. This can be because a charity doesn't have the resources, time, volunteers or financial to undertake such fundraising efforts alone. It might also occur because a charity believes a third party or external fundraiser would do a better job than they could. Now, as we've stated throughout the webinar, outsourcing fundraising to third parties should not be taken lightly. A charity's responsible persons have ultimate responsibility over a charity's fundraising behaviour, including any efforts conducted on your charity's behalf by others. Without proper management of such arrangements, the risks to a charity can be significant. There have been some recent high profile examples linking some third party fundraisers, both here and abroad, with inappropriate conduct. And while that conduct obviously reflects badly on the firms themselves, 
there has also been a negative impact, impact on the charities which have used their service. When considering working with a fundraising agency, a charity should look beyond just the financial cost. It might be tempting to choose a fundraising agency based solely on the cost of the service, particularly if the charity's fundraising needs are urgent or if they're strapped for money. But there are several factors beyond cost which charities should examine. These include the fundraising agency's values and how they align to the charities, its operational transparency, its reputation, its financial situation, the fundraising agency's expertise and area, experience, sorry, and areas of expertise, I'm getting a bit ahead of myself there, uh, its performance and its structure and how it uses subcontractors. Before entering into an agreement with a fundraising agency, a charity should consider these due diligence steps. They should assess the risks of working with a fundraising agency. They should know the operations, processes and cultures of the agency. They should consider the supply chains involved and they should be prepared to seek expert advice if needed. Again, the ACNC has some great guidance on working with fundraising agencies. That can be found at acnc.gov.au forward slash fundraising agencies. The good news is we also have a podcast episode, which will be about 15 minutes long, on this very topic, which may be of interest to you. In it, the ACNC's Assistant Commissioner, David Locke, speaks about using fundraising agencies and the things charities should consider when do doing so. You can download or listen to the podcast at acnc.gov.eu forward slash podcast or search for Charity Chat, capital C, capital C, although I don't think that matters, on iTunes or wherever you download your podcasts. More information is also available from the Fundraising Institute of Australia, which will introduce a new code for professional fundraising in Australia at the start of next year, as well as from the Public Fundraising Regu Regulatory Association. And their web addresses are again at the bottom of the screen right there. So another major issue charities need to address when raising funds relates to how they approach and treat vulnerable people. Now, the exact meaning of the term vulnerable people is one which might be debated. But in our guide, Fundraising People in Vulnerable Circumstances, we say that a person may be considered vulnerable if their circumstances mean that their capacity to make a decision is reduced. Importantly, vulnerability can be permanent or temporary and can vary greatly from person to person. The ACNC lists several common examples of people in vulnerable circumstances. They include people with intellectual disabilities that may affect their comprehension or understanding, those with physical or mental health issues, those who don't fully understand the language the fundraiser is speaking, people experiencing financial difficulty, people experiencing stress or anxiety, and that can actually include stress caused by a donation request from a charity. Uh, anyone under the influence of alcohol or drugs, those who are unable to care for themselves, and that's uh, especially those who maybe rely on the support or, or the care of a charity, and the elderly, especially those without close support, or the very young. The extent someone's capacity to make a decision about donating is reduced will depend on their particular circumstances. Some people in vulnerable circumstances may still be capable of making an informed decision if they have extra care and support. Having the capacity to make a decision to donate to charity means that a person is able to, either alone or with support, fully understand the information presented to them, carefully consider the information and the consequences of their decision and communicate their decision clearly. Our guidance, that's acnc.gov.au forward slash vulnerable people, provides a rundown on how charities should interact with vulnerable people and the steps they should take to treat people in vulnerable circumstances fairly. And again, look out for a podcast episode on this topic, which will be appearing on the ACNC website in the next couple of weeks. So a few moments ago, we touched on charities using third party fundraisers or fundraising agencies to raise money. Doing so means that charities are actually outlaying funds to raise money. And this is something that members of the general public can have a problem with. Now, the ACNC is clear on the matter. Charities can spend money on fundraising activities. 
It is perfectly acceptable for a charity to incur expenses when undertaking fundraising activities, as long as it's in line with its charitable purpose. Any decisions on whether a charity spends funds, uh, spends money to fundraise again, rests with the charity's responsible persons. Another important element here is the need for a charity to be able to adequately explain why it needs to spend money on fundraising. If your charity decides to go down this path, it should be able to explain to anyone who asks the reasons for doing so. And again, if your charity spends money on fundraising that falls outside of its charitable purposes or is unjustifiably, unjustifiably excessive and may breach the ACNC Act and governance standards, the ACNC can take action. As any charity collect, conducts fundraising, it will collect data and information. That information might cover donors past or present, their names, their addresses, contact details, financial details, uh, and perhaps other personal information as well. Collecting data is a normal byproduct of what of many charitable activities, and that includes fundraising, but it brings with it important legal and ethical responsibilities. There are laws at both the federal and state levels that may apply to the way a charity collects, stores and uses information and data about people. A charity's responsible persons, again, need to be aware of their legal requirements of managing people's information and data, as well as relevant laws. You can refer to the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner website, that's the OAIC website, for a full list of relevant laws in your state or territory. There's a link there at the bottom of your screen. At a federal level, charities which meet selected criteria must comply with the Federal Privacy Act. More details on those criteria are available, again, on the OAIC website, as well as in the ACNC's Managing People's Information and Data Guide. That's acnc.gov.au forward slash information and data. The Privacy Act requires organisations to be clear about when they are collecting personal information, why they're collecting personal information and what they'll do with it, and how people can gain access to the personal information an organisation holds about them and correct any information if required. Within the Privacy Act are 13 Australian privacy principles which govern how personal information, that's information that can be used to identify a person, such as a name and address, must be managed. Again, we won't list all 13 principles right now. They are covered in more detail on the OAIC website and in our guide, but generally they cover a number of issues relating to charities and data, including proper management, collection and handling of personal information, the use and disclosure of personal information, the security of personal information you might have, including who has access to it, and personal information and direct marketing. As a final point on managing people's data, the ACNC's Managing People's Information and Data Guide offers a series of useful tips on developing a policy to handle this type of information. Policy like this might include examples of the type of information about people that the charity collects, stores and uses, the processes by which the charity collects people's data, the purposes for which the charity collects, stores and uses people's information, how and where the charity securely stores and protects the data, an explanation of when the charity will disclose people's information and to whom, an explanation of how the charity will use people's information and data, the processes for addressing breaches of privacy or complaints about the charity's management of that data and the conditions on which an individual can access their information and the processes by which they can do so. Again, such a policy should be regularly reviewed and updated. And when handling people's data and information and looking at a policy on the issue, one question you should ask yourselves is this, how would you like information, uh, an organisation to treat and handle any information of yours they might have? So when nearing the end of the formal presentation today, um, you can see here on the screen a rundown of the websites and the links that we've mentioned today. All of them are worth a look at um, to help your charity better understand what it should be doing in regards to fundraising. We can't emphasise enough the importance of charities undertaking solid planning, having in place good management practices and exhibiting behaviour which engenders trust and confidence amongst the public. Fundraising is an area under much scrutiny in the public, in the media, everywhere. It's important that your charity takes this seriously. 
its legal obligations and responsibilities to uphold wider community expectations. Doing so addresses many of the issues people have and cuts down on fundraising related risks. So what we'll do now is we'll open things up for some questions. We've got a bit of time left. So keep sending them through to us, um, through to uh, Maddie and Nathan, who we've got on hand to help us respond. But we'll, we'll open it up today now. And we've got quite a few that's come in. Um, Chris, first off, um, online fundraising across Australia. What are the rules and regulations? Um, we've had a few people ask this as well, particularly given that it's that's come up throughout the, the presentation we've just given. Um, online fundraising, um, donations, crowdfunding, um, these types of fundraising have grown hugely uh, over the past decade, perhaps a little bit longer. Uh, the problem with that is that the law hasn't kept up in many ways. Um, and that is making things a little bit cumbersome. Uh, as we suggested uh, in the main part of the webinar, uh, what this means is that your charity needs to comply with the differing state and territory fundraising leg legislation if you're looking to fundraise online or on a national basis. Uh, a charity <clears throat> which, which doesn't do that it might be in breach of fundraising laws and regulations if it accepts funds from someone living in a state or territory where the charity is not registered to fundraise. The same is true of a national appeal that doesn't, that doesn't have an online component. Look, this is yeah cumbersome. Uh, it can be annoying for charities. Um, it can be yeah a, a big hassle, uh, particularly given how many charities now wish to fundraise online, uh, wish to attract donations from uh, from crowdfunding from across borders uh, and and all that sort of stuff. Um, it's one of the I guess one of the driving reasons uh, that we at the ACNC are working hard to to cut that red tape, um, to harmonise requirements uh, and those reporting processes in areas like fundraising. Um, we've, we've made a good start. There's still much to do. Um, there's more information on, on the, uh, the state and territory fundraising legislation uh, on our fundraising page, which is uh, acnc.gov.au forward slash fundraising. Um, we've also, I guess, in a, in a related uh, series of questions, I can see a few of them have come through again, um, we've been asked about fundraising licences from state regulators, uh, whether they're required or whether uh, organisations or charities just go through the ACNC. Um, the answer to that one would be for, for most charities, uh, the answer is still yes. Um, again, that situation is changing with our red tape reduction work. Uh, the good news is we do have a couple of states, well, one state and one territory, um, where there has been uh, there has been good progress. Um, so, if your charity is registered with the ACNC and is looking to fundraise in either the ACT or South Australia, you're actually exempt from having to get a fundraising license, which is wonderful. In South Australia, charities registered with the ACNC simply need to notify Consumer and Business Affairs South Australia, they're the regulator in that state. They've got to just notify them of their intention to, uh, to collect funds in South Australia. Once they've done so, they will be deemed to, to hold a fundraising license. In the ACT, charities registered with the ACNC don't require a fundraising license to raise funds there. Now, that's with a bit of a caveat. Individuals or organisations that are not registered with the ACNC but intend to fundraise in the Territory do need a licence. They may also have ongoing obligations under fundraising laws in the ACT, including the requirement to submit financial reports. Now, again, the ACNC is going to keep working in this area. We're working with a number of states and territories and we're making very good pro progress and we'll keep you up to date on, uh, on continued or further progress that's made. A uh, good place to check in is on our red tape reduction page, which is uh, acnc.gov.au forward slash red tape reduction. And again, our fundraising page, that contains plenty of links and relevant info as well. Um, one other question we got asked, or one of many questions we got asked, um, there's, I guess, a, a bit of a feeling that if uh, a charity has had a good year in terms of uh, finances, 
whether it's appropriate to conduct fundraising uh, in such a good year. Um, what are your What are your thoughts on that one, April? Yeah, so I guess that's something that may depend on your individual circumstances. But from an ACNC perspective, we can act if a charity fails to meet its obligations or if it breaches the ACNC Act. Um, now, if you've had a good year, so shall we say um, you may see as a prudent decision to keep some funds from a profitable year in reserve to cover for future operating costs um, at your charity. Um, doing so shouldn't see you unable to solicit donations or fundraise for, say, a special project or initiative or an activity. What you do need to think about, though, is whether its fundraising activity is fair and reasonable and isn't seen as an unnecessary or excessive expense, um, that its conduct in fundraising is proper and doesn't damage public trust and confidence, and its fundraising complies with the law and with community standards. Um, yeah, so informing prospective donors why you are fundraising is always a good fundraising practice. Um, part of this might see a charity spend time explaining why it's fundraising for a specific project or explain whether you've had a good year or not. It's always a good, just in addition to that, there's always, a, a, I guess, a good, um, a good opportunity here that if you are talking to people directly about trying to gain donations from them, um, have a page on your website where you perhaps have, you know, a good amount of information set up about uh, a project or an initiative that you're undertaking and that you're fundraising for um, and refer people to it. Say to them, hey, go have a look at this web page. This is, this is what we're doing. This is the impact that your donations can have. Uh, this is how they'll help. Uh, and this, apart from perhaps selling them on the idea that they might want to support you uh, and, and hopefully making your fundraising more successful, it's good governance and it's, it shows that your organisation takes seriously its responsibility to perhaps explain to donors and to the general public where their money goes and, and what it's being used towards. There are uh, there have been a number of times in recent times where people have donated to organisations or to um, to initiatives and that's been about it. They've never really, it's sort of gone into a black hole and they've never really received a whole heap of feedback about, well, my donation helped this or my donation did that. And if you were that donor, you'd probably feel a little bit less inclined to give the next time round. Um, so yeah, just just the, those little things, you know, the explanations and have that web page and, and, and those sorts of stuff, that can make a huge difference uh, to people and to people's attitude towards giving to you. Um, just again, having a look through some of the questions that are, that are coming through, uh, there's, I can see here, there's a number speaking about fundraising permits and fundraising uh, state by state regulators and that sort of stuff, particularly when it comes to online fundraising. Um, we don't pretend that it's easy to ensure that you have all of the bits and pieces you require, which is again why we're working to cut red tape. If you are working with an organisation that is prov providing perhaps a fundraising uh, platform for you online, uh, there are a number around, um, similarly crowdfunding platforms online, uh, what we would suggest is to have a chat to them as well, um, to talk to them about what you need in terms of your online fundraising. If you've decided to go and work with an online, online fundraising platform and you want to uh, raise some funds from around Australia, have a chat to them and talk to them about what you'll need to do, uh, what the requirements are, and also obviously what that fundraising platform might need in terms of documentation and all of that sort of stuff to make sure that you're, you're up, you're online, you're on their site, registered, legit, all of that sort of stuff, doing the right thing. Um, those fundraising platforms, clearly they're in it for, that's their job. They're knowledgeable uh, as well in such matters. And it's a good idea to have a chat to them if you're going to work to them, work with them, um, not only to get further information and make sure you're doing the right thing, but for due diligence uh, as well. Um, there has been a question come through about crowdfunding. Uh, now, there are regulations that you need to comply with as well. Did you want to have a quick word about that one, April? 
Yeah, so I guess just briefly, um, yeah, as Chris touched on, uh, crowdfunding um, is growing in popularity. So just as background, um, crowdfunding generally involves an individual or an, or, or an organisation setting up a fundraising target online and then asking people on the internet to donate so that they can reach that target. Um, it has made online fundraising easier for individuals and groups, um, and it's also opened up online fundraising to a large number of new donors. So yeah, as we've touched on, um, I guess the thing is, the law hasn't really kept up with this innovation and technology. So yeah, as, as we've mentioned, your charity may need to comply with various state and territory fundraising legislation. And if it intends to fundraise on a national basis, which crowdfunding um, can involve, then you may need to be registered to fundraise in each state and territory. Um, so yeah, that's not in our jurisdiction, um, but we do have referrals on our website for who you should be contacting and having those discussions with. Um, I guess beyond regulations, there are a variety of other questions you should ask and, and points you should consider before embarking on a crowdfunding effort. And we do actually have a really great guide on the topic, and that's at acnc.gov.au forward slash crowdfunding. So if anyone is thinking of using fundraising, uh, crowdfunding to fundraise, um, I recommend going and having a look at that guide and it has, as, it, as it has information that you should, um, I guess, review before making the decision to pursue crowdfunding. Um, yes, yeah, so that's, I guess, the best advice we can really offer on the topic. Yeah. We've got a question through here as well. Um, Thoughts regarding fundraising apps or apps that encourage people to fundraise directly from their phone. Has this been effective? Um, look, any method of fundraising can be effective as long as you, uh, as a charity, put the effort into it, um, ensure that you're doing it legally uh, and within the guidelines that you need to do it. Um, but also, again, Fundraising itself is is it's a very voluntary behaviour from from members of the general public. You you can't compel them. You can't grab them by the scruff of the neck and force them to give. Um, so any uh, method of fundraising, be it online, be it shaking a tin at some traffic lights, be it a fundraising app on on the phone, um, you need to be able to back that up in terms of. Uh, telling your story in terms of explaining what you do with the money that you will raise uh, to provide a compelling case for people to uh, jump in and to support you in, in some way, shape or form. Um, for, I guess, electronic based fundraising, um, it's always a good idea to, if you have a, um, a website, and I shouldn't say if because most of you will, um, to have prominent links to your uh, online fundraising facility, perhaps on your phone, uh, on your homepage, um, and it can be as simple as something that is a little button on your homepage, you know, um, to donate. Give you know, click here for more information about donating. Click here, something like that. Take you takes the person on your website straight to the page where they can donate. They can receive or, or read more information about what they're donating to. Um, and it pulls them in. Um, that's the whole, I guess, idea of, of that sort of thing, that just having an online fundraising or, or any sort of fundraising app isn't going to attract people to give. What you have to do is you have to pull them in. You have to give them a good good sort of, uh, I guess, you know, case or a good reason to give to support, uh, not only at the time that they're going to open their wallets or get their credit cards out, but also if they're prepared to give to you on an ongoing basis. Why should they give to you on an ongoing basis and what uh, benefits uh, are the beneficiaries of, of their money receiving? Um, so whenever you're looking at using uh, uh, any method of fundraising, always just remember that it's up to you to make the case for people to come in and to give money, to donate, and just having a platform alone, uh, an app on your phone, uh, online, anything like that, isn't uh, any guarantee that anyone's going to come in and support you. So you need to have the support work as well as the uh, as well as the app and as well as the shaking the tin at the traffic lights and that sort of stuff. Um, we've been asked too about uh, a question about a fundraising activity that 
a charity is undertaking, but it might also be connected to the personal interests of a board member. Um, any thoughts on that one, April? Um, yeah, I guess we touched on it briefly during the presentation. Um, so at a general level and without going into specifics, um, under the ACNC's governance standard number five, a charity must ensure its board members are aware of and are subject to a set of duties. So one of those duties is to disclose any perceived or actual conflicts of interest, and that conflict of interest um, could be in relation to fundraising. Um, yeah, meeting those governance standards is a requirement of registration with the ACNC, and the ACNC may take, act may take action if a charity does not meet the standards. So I'd recommend just having a look at our guide on managing conflicts of interest, and that can be found on our website at acnc.gov.au forward slash conflicts of interest. And like with any other questions that you might have, if you're not sure, you can, uh, you know, give our friendly advice staff a call and that's on 132262 and we can certainly take a look at the individual circumstances and give you some more tailored advice then. I think despite the fact that it's about 15 minutes early, that might be just about, might be time to wrap up. People might want to go and have an early lunch. So uh, that's a good thing. But the good news is we will hang around. Um, Nathan and Madison will uh, continue to respond to questions and in having a look, thank you for sending some of these questions in. Um, if some of these questions aren't answered, uh, please again, feel free to get in touch with the uh, ACNC education team directly. That's at ACNC, uh, sorry, education at acnc.gov.au. Drop us an email um, and ask away and what we'll be able to do is get back in touch with a, with a response or point you in the right direction to another resource or, um, someone to talk to, uh, to give you some, uh, to give you some good advice. Um, again, yes, we'll hang around a little bit longer. Um, also, we just want to mention too, we're looking to improve what we do at ACNC Education. So when things are done here, you'll get a little survey. Uh, we would love it if you could just take the time to let us know what you thought of today's session uh, and just to, uh, I guess, share your comments and your thoughts. Uh, beyond that, that's about up it from this end. Uh, thank you to Nathan and Madison who are going to continue to type away. Um, thank you to April and thank you to everyone for joining us here. Until we see you again, see you later. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye.